don't you turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus loves you. Turn to your other neighbor and say, Jesus loves me. Amen. This is the truth, right? I think if we just capture that, put that in our hearts and in our lives, and live from that, it's going to revolutionize our lives. Amen. The presence of God is so good. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys for leading us into the Lord's presence. Let's pray before we get started here. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we appreciate you so much. All that you are, all that you have done throughout history, today, and in our lives, we are so, so grateful to you. God, we thank you that your presence is here. We don't have to go to a place. We don't have to do certain things, God, but your presence is is here with us, living, shaping, molding us, making us more like you all the time, God. We love you so very much. Today, as we gather together and you're, look at your word together, God, we just ask for your Holy Spirit to lead us, to speak to us, God. We open up our hearts to your word, to your Holy Spirit. We pray, God, that you would do what you want to do. You would say to us what you want us to say. You would help us to grow in the area where you want to help us to grow so we can be more like you and walk in your love. We thank you for your presence this afternoon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let me start by reading a verse. This verse is in my... uh, in the message today, but it's been talked about already in worship. It's Proverbs 18, verse 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are saved. Why don't you guys say that after me? The name of the Lord. All right, everybody all together. Let's give it a little bit of uh, effort, a little bit of gusto there. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are saved. Amen. Amen. We're going to talk a little bit today about the name of the Lord, but we're doing it in the context of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is a series that we've been on for the last, uh, this is the fourth week. We had an introduction week, and then uh, Commandments 1 and 2. Now we're on Commandment number 3. And if you guys remember... The commandments were not given for the purpose of salvation or redemption. Okay, the commandments were given to the Israelites when Moses went up on Mount Sinai. He got, met with God, got the Ten Commandments from God. But this was after they had been redeemed out of Egypt. They were living in a land of slavery. God said, I want you to be free from that land God did miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, and the last one being the Passover, which is so, so symbolic of Jesus dying on the cross and redeeming us from death. And and God led the Israelites in this this annual tradition of Passover. This was the first time that it began, but it became a yearly festival for the Israelites to remember the redemption of Israel from Egypt. And so the the law was not given for the purpose of salvation or for redemption. God brought them out of slavery through the Red Sea on dry ground, destroyed their enemies in the Red Sea, and then they were living in the wilderness with God's miraculous daily provision, and they were free. No longer slaves. And then God gave the Ten Commandments. God gave the law, the Torah. So the purpose is not for salvation or redemption. We can translate that into our personal lives as well. We are not saved or redeemed by obeying the law. That happened on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he saved us, he redeemed us. There's nothing more that we can add to our salvation because Jesus did it all already, right? Jesus did it. We can't do anything more. 
if we can do something more, then that's saying that Jesus' work was incomplete. But that's not true. He redeemed us. He has full power to save and redeem, and that's what we hang our hope on is Jesus. But God gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments for relationship. And if we look at the Ten Commandments, the first four are about our vertical relationship with God. The, the last six are about our relationship with others. And so if we look closely at each one, we can see, yep, this has to do with this vertical relationship with God. And so what we're looking at today is one of those commands that has to do with our vertical relationship with God. The first one, does anybody remember the first command? What is it? Okay. No other gods. Full stop. Period. Okay. It's not saying God has to be first, and then you can have other gods, second, third, fourth, that's okay. No, God says, nope, one God, me. God doesn't want to share the room with any other gods. It's just him and him alone. Second command, does anybody remember what the second command is? All right, we have a, an A-plus student sitting here in the front row. That's right. Yes, so no images or no likenesses. And don't bow down to them. Basically, it's saying don't make any idols. God, God said don't make any images of things on the earth or in the water or things that fly in the sky and bow down to them. God doesn't want any of that. God said no. Remember what God said? He, he put his image and his likeness in us. He put his spirit in us. He created us to carry the image of God and rule and reign and have dominion on the earth through his spirit. So he doesn't want us, the carriers of his image, bowing down to another image. Okay? Today, we're going to talk about the third command. Okay? And it's all about the name of God. Can we put the first slide up on the screen? I think we can. I believe. I believe. Can we put the first slide up? There we go. All right. Let's read this together. One, two, three. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So this is the third command. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. We sang about it. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. But this verse says, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. It's interesting, some of the laws, if we look at the laws of God and the context of the Israelites when they were living in the wilderness. They left a land of many gods and they were entering into a land of many gods. They left Egypt where there was hundreds of gods. They were going into the land of Canaan where there were lots and lots of gods there too, lots of idols. And God said with the commands, if you do this, you are going to stand out. You're going to be different from all of the other nations around you. You're going to be something that is like a light that's shining in the darkness. You're going to be something different. With all of the other gods, with all of the other nations, they had idols. They had the, you know, Egypt had the, 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 the idol that looked like a calf. And they had the idol that looked like a cow. And they had this idol and that idol. And they would always bow down to these images. But God said, no, you're not to have any other images. I am the God. I am the invisible God. You worship me, but there's no image. Because there's nothing that can compare to our God. And so God was calling them to be different in terms of things like, you know, next week we're going to talk about the Sabbath law. That was something that was completely foreign to the nations that were around. But God said, no, I want you to live differently. And the way that God wants for us to live is a life that stands out. A life that is different. A life that people can notice and say, wow, what? there's something different about you. There's something completely different. And it's okay 
it's okay to be different. It's okay to stand out. I want to talk to all you young people, you kids sitting in here. Don't always try to fit in. Don't think that, yeah, I have to fit in all the time. I have to be like them or I have to do this to be like my friends or do this and use these words and say these things and live like them. Don't always try to fit in. Light doesn't fit into darkness, amen? Light stands out. Light stands out. It's okay to be different. God calls us to be different. God calls us to be different in a good way. God said that he was making the nation of Israel to be a nation of kings and priests. Priests and kings for who? All the other nations around. They were to be leaders. They were to be the ones who had the... A priest is someone who has the relationship with God. They're connected to God. And they lead people to God. They're that mediator between God and man. And this is the same calling that God has for us as well. To be people who are kings and priests. People who bring people to God and bring God to people. This is the calling that God had on the Israelites and that's the calling that he has for us as well. So God has called us, and in, in the law that he's given, he shows, my people stand out. My people are different. But it's not just something that, oh, it's different just for the sake of being different. No, it's different to live the blessed life that God has intended for us to live. Amen? So Exodus 20, verse 7. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. What does it mean when we talk about the name of God? The name of God. If we study the Bible and we look in the Bible, so many different times there are different names for God. There are so many different names for God. We can think of Emmanuel, okay? Emmanuel, God who is with us. That's one name for God. That was the name that they gave. G that, that was what they said. The name of Jesus is going to be Emmanuel, God who is with us. Another one would be the Prince of Peace. This is very descriptive of who Jesus is going to be, who God is going to be, is someone who leads with peace. Okay, the son of a king, but also someone who leads with peace. Other, There's other... Um, Names of God in the Old Testament, all of the Jehovah names. Jehovah was the name that kind of we use in English, but in the original Hebrew, it was the name Yahweh. Okay, and that's kind of, even that's the wrong pronunciation for it. But that name of God is used almost 7,000 times in the Bible. Every time you see in, in the English Bible, where it says LORD with all capital letters. You guys ever notice that? Like, why is that all capitalized? Well, they use the word LORD. They put the LORD in there, but it really should be Yahweh or Jehovah because that's what they're, uh, that's what's in the original Hebrew. So every time you see L-O-R-D all capitalized, that's Jehovah or Yahweh. It's used almost 7,000 times. But it's interesting in the Old Testament too because they couple that name with a lot of different names or different descriptions of who God is. Like when uh, Abraham went up onto the mountain, and it was, it's the story where he was going to sacrifice his, the promised son Isaac. God told Abraham to go and sacrifice his only son. This is the, the son of the promise, where God said, I'm going to make you into a nation and all the, all the people in the world are going to be blessed through this son, Isaac. But then God said, all right, take Isaac up on the mountain and sacrifice him. So out of obedience, Abraham took Isaac, took him up on the mountain, was about to kill him. And God provided a ram that was stuck in the thickets. And God said, take that ram. Thank you for your obedience. Thank you for your willingness to follow me with all of your heart. Take this ram, sacrifice that, save your son. At that moment... The word of the Lord came to Abraham, and Abraham said, God, Jehovah, is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. And so it was through experiences that people gave God a new name, where he said, 
God, da 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 da, God, da 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 da. And so there were several different names in the Bible. There's another story that happened. You guys probably remember this story too, where Joshua was leading the armies of Israel. They had not gone into the promised land yet, but Joshua was leading, uh, leading the children of Israel in a battle. They were fighting, and God told Moses, okay, Moses was still alive then, go up on the mountain and lift your hands up. And when you lift your hands up, Joshua and the Israelites are going to win. If you drop your hands, Joshua is going to lose. So Abraham, or sorry, Moses went up on the mountain, watching the battle probably from the top of the mountain, lifting his hands and watching Joshua start to have victory. All the Israelites start to have victory. Maybe his arms got tired. He's like, oh, i got to stretch a little bit. Oh, no, you know, Israelites starting to lose. So they went back and forth. And so obviously Moses wants the Israelites to win. So he's trying his hardest to keep his arms up. Then Aaron and Hur came and said, all right, Moses, we're going to help you. We'll hold your arms up and we'll see victory today. And at that moment, God got a new name. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, our banner, the Lord, our banner. We lift up the name of God in worship and praise. He's the Lord, our banner. We have victory. And so there's a number of different stories in the Old Testament. Um, another one would be uh, from Psalm 23. Jehovah Ra'a, the Lord, our shepherd. Jehovah Rapha in Exodus 15, the Lord, our healer. Then there's lots, lots of other ones. Je, uh, Jehovah to Sid Canoe, which is the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. Experiences in the Old Testament gave God new names. And when we talk about the name of God, the name of God is important because it's who he is. It's his character and it's his reputation. This is our God. This is who our God is. And so when we say the name of God, it's not just a name. It's not like Jason. It's not just like a name. It's not, okay, yeah, that's your name. But it's, it's so much more than that because it's who God is. But in the same, in the same context, in the same Example, our name that we have also tells about who we are, too. So think about it. For example, okay, you know my name, Jason Prosser. Though if you know me well enough, you know that's not actually my legal name, okay? People, people who really know me really know my name. And I'll tell you, it's Dale Jason Prosser, okay? So you know my full name now. So... If you know me, you know that the name Jason Prosser, what it means. That you know my character. You know who I am. My family, who knows me more, would know really what that name means. Okay? Is it a good character? Is it a good reputation? Okay? They would know me clearly. They would know what that name means because they know me even more clearly. And the same is true with God. When we know God clearly, like these experiences, these names from experiences in the Bible, we know what that name means. We know the name of God. God is not just a word. It's an experience. It's his reputation. It's who he is. When Gideon, I love the story of Gideon. You know, here's a guy who is, you know, threshing the grain in a hole because he was afraid of, the, afraid of the, his enemy. And God said to him, the angel of the Lord came to him and said, what are you doing here? And Gideon said something that was powerful. He said, he said, I've heard the stories of what God did, how he delivered the Israelites from the Egyptians. And he said, I've heard all of these stories, and I've heard these things that happened, and this is our God. This is who our God is. Why are we living in slavery now? 
Where is this God? I know the miracles that our God can do. And so he knew the name of God. He knew the reputation of God. He knew the character of God. And so he was calling on God's reputation, on God's character. He said, God, I need you. And we know what happened after that. God did a miracle uh, with, 300, with Gideon and 300 people. They defeated all, the, uh, all of their enemies, and they had victory. But, it, but Gideon knew clearly, this is who my God is. And, and at that moment, the angel of the Lord said, go in the strength that you have. What strength was that? Oh, he was hiding in a pit. No, the strength that he had was his knowledge of who his God was. Amen? So that's where his strength was. We also see in the Lord's Prayer. How does the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Okay, that's what the English says. Your name is worthy of praise. Your name is worthy of glory and honor. So that's the first point in our prayers that Jesus says. Lift up the name of Jesus high. Know who your God is. Remind yourself, this is the name of God. Okay? But God was saying to the Israelites, I want you to be careful about my name. I want you to be careful about how you use my name. God didn't want the Israelites to profane his name. Profane means to treat it as worthless, to treat it as something that's just normal, normal, tomada, tomada. It's just the same, same all the time, okay? God doesn't want us to, to think like that. It's not just another name. It's not just another word. It's something that's valuable and important because this is the God of the universe. This is the God who breathed life into you. This is the God who gives you every heartbeat that, that beats in your heart. Whether we serve him or not, he's the God who gives us life. This is our God. God doesn't want us to treat his name as just something normal. Listen to this in Ezekiel chapter 36. We're going to go to the third slide here. It's not this one, not the next one, but the one after this. Ezekiel 36, verses 20 to 23. So this is what happened. This is what happened after, uh, after the Israelites were defeated and they were led into captivity. Okay, this is after the fall of Jerusalem and is the, the divided kingdoms of Israel and Judah. They were both led into captivity. This is in Ezekiel. And this is what God said about the people of Israel. When they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said of them, this is okay, so this would be the other, the other nations around them, what they said about the, Israel. These are the people of the Lord, and yet they have gone out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name. See, God cares about his name. God cares about his character and his reputation and who people say he is, God cares about it. I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. When we honor the name of God, the nations will know that he is, that he is the Lord. When we profane his name, God doesn't take that lightly. God doesn't take it lightly when we hide or when we say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but my life is just the same as anybody else's. Okay? I do the same things, go the same places, speak the same words, act the same way, but I'm a Christian. No. Oh. When, when we live just like the world lives, but we call ourselves a Christian... That's profaning the name of Christ. 
Christian. Christians, people with Christ's name. Now, this doesn't, I'm not saying you have to be, you know, perfect in everything that you do. God, God has mercy and grace. But what's in your heart? It's not so much about the things we do, but in our heart. Are we living for ourselves or are we living for the Lord? Okay, God doesn't want us to profane his name. Let me read a few verses from the Bible that talk about the name of the Lord. And sometimes when we talk about the name of the Lord, it's interesting because you would think that some of these verses would be like, okay, call upon God and you will be saved. The righteous run into God and they are saved. No, it says Proverbs 18.10, the, right, the name of the Lord, the name of the Lord. It's not saying God is a strong tower, but it says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are saved. <clears throat> Excuse me. Listen to some of these verses. Proverbs 18.10. Read it again. Read it at the beginning. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. So it's not saying God is a strong tower. The Lord is a strong tower. Jesus is a strong tower. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. So his character and his reputation, who he is, is a strong tower. We can run to it. We can depend on it. We can go to him for safety. We can say, God, I'm standing on your reputation. I'm standing on your character. I'm running to it, and I know that I will be saved because this is who you are. This is your name. Listen to another verse. We have this one on the slides. Romans 10.13 for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't say for everyone who calls on Jesus. Okay? Calls on the name of the Lord. We call upon his holy name, his character, his reputation, who he is. We call upon the name of the Lord and we will be saved. Here's another one. Next slide. But as many as received him, but all, oh, sorry, but I'll read it from right from the slide there. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So we believe in his name, his character, his reputation, who he is. Okay? And one of my favorites. Oh, okay, let me, let me read some verses here in John 17. This is uh, the prayer of Jesus when he was with his disciples before he went to the cross, on the night before he went to the cross. It's in John 17. I don't have this one on the slides, but I want to read it for you. John 17, 6, and we'll also read verse 11. Listen to what Jesus prays to God about himself and in relation to the disciples. This is what he says. Jesus says, I have revealed your name... To the people you gave me from the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. So Jesus came to reveal the name of God to us, to people. Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. So Jesus came to reveal God's character, God's reputation, who he is, his love, all of those things is what Jesus came to reveal. I've come to reveal your name to those that you've given me. And in verse 11, he says, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by your name. Protect them by your name. It's amazing if we read how many times in the Bible, not just Old Testament, but New Testament as well, they talk about the name of God, the name of God. The name of God is so powerful. Protect them by your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. And there's other, other parts in that same uh, chapter that talk about the name of God and what the name of God can do. And here's another beautiful one in uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. 
Philippians 2, verse 9. I'm going to read it right from the, right from the Bible here because I don't have the full thing in my notes. Philippians 2, 2 verse 9, where it talks about Jesus being given the name. It says, For this reason God exalt, highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus has the name that is above every name. It's a name that sets the captives free. It's the name that we run to. It's the name that can protect us and watch over us as we run to it and depend on it and trust the name that is above all names. God doesn't want us to take his name in vain. God wants us to, in our heart, always hold the name of God so highly and so valuable that we never, ever, ever profane the name of God. I have three points how we can protect ourselves from profaning God's name. Okay, This is a principle, not just something that we should do, but it's a way that God wants us to live. And it's the principle of humility. It's the principle of realizing who I am and who God is and how much I need him. It's the principle of saying, God, you're my everything. When we pray, the first point is that we need to be careful how we pray. Okay, slide number six, in prayer. We can honor God when we pray. Okay, in the Old Testament, when they got when they received this law, all of the nations around them they would they would pray to their God by chanting, and they would say the name of their God over and 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 over again. Okay, and that's how they called on the name of their God. You know, whether it was Baal, they would be Baal, 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 over and over and over and over again to call on the name of their God. If you read the story in, uh, I think it's First First Kings 17, when they went up on the on the mountain and uh, Elijah called all of the prophets of Baal, and they were calling on the name of their God over and over again, over and over and over again, from morning till the evening. They were cutting themselves and doing all this stuff, calling upon their, the name of their God. They were chanting, they were calling, they were saying to their God over and over and over again, asking their God to help them. But God doesn't want his people praying like that because we're not people who convince God to do something, but we have a God who hears, we have a God who's alive, we have a God who has relationship with us, we have a God who is real. God, our God, is not a magical incantation that we just say the magic words and poof, God does whatever we ask him to do. It's not, we can't control God, okay? I love how C.S. Lewis defines God. He uses the, uses the image of a lion named Aslan. He says he's not a tame lion. Our God is not a tame lion. And, and, He's not a God that we can control, but he's a God who loves us, but he's good, and he's with us, and he's always with us. God is not, the name of God is not a magical incantation. It's not just the words that we speak, okay? They tried to do this in Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 19, there was a guy who said he wanted to use the power that he saw Paul doing, and he said, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. In the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. And the evil spirits rose up and said, we know who Paul is. We know who Jesus is, but we don't know you. And they beat him up and he went running out of the house naked and he took off. He was trying to just say the same words that somebody else said without the relationship. Remember, this is about relationship. This is about our hearts connecting to God. And that's what God desires in prayer. Not just, okay, I speak the right words, 
and something great happens. No, it's you're connecting with the heart of God. We use his name vainly and profanely when we pray in the wrong way. James 4.3 says, You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. Okay, another word, another uh, version says, when you ask amiss. That word wrongly or amiss, it means it's, you ask in a sickly way, in a, in a sick sort of way. And you ask for things that are going to bring destruction and sickness and, and, and frustration into your lives because you're asking out of your own selfishness. The way that God wants us to ask and pray is according to his word and according to his will. Like Jesus taught in Matthew, where Jesus said, Ask that my kingdom would come and that my will would be done. When you pray, pray according to the will of Jesus. Sometimes we don't know what's going to happen. We don't even know sometimes what the right thing is to pray. I've had that happen before when I'm in a situation and I'm like, God, I don't know if this is the right way. I don't know if this is the right way. I don't know if this is the right way. But we can always be sure that, we can, that God will answer his prayer when he said, God, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. And when we let God's word and God's will be our guidelines for praying, we can be sure that God will answer our prayer. The next way that we can profane God's name is in prophecy, in wrong prophecy. Okay? Sometimes people share their opinions and they say, God told me, or thus saith the Lord, or if the guy says to the girl, God told me that we're going to get married one day. Well, I would keep that to yourself if I were you. That's profaning God's name. It's saying, yeah, God told me. You know, you know what I don't like? I don't like when people say, you know, okay, maybe this is just a pet peeve of mine, and maybe, you know, this is not an anointed part of the sermon. But when people say, God said, da-da-da-da-da, or God told me, da-da-da-da-da, how can you even argue with that, right? They're, it, it's almost like they're closing themselves to a, a continued conversation. It's like a trump card. You just play, yeah, the biggest card on there, and you win, you win the argument. All right, I, I mean, I can't, I can't argue with that anymore. You say, God told me. Let's keep God out of our own opinions, okay? We have the word of God. God told me the Bible, right? If it's in the Bible, God said it. We have the, the, the true word of God, the infallible word of God. Sometimes your own opinions don't measure up to this. Don't say God told me if it's just your own opinion. The last way that we can profane the name of God, and we need to be careful, is in our proclamation, the things that we say. Now, this one's important. Leviticus 19.12 says, Do not swear by my name. Okay, do not swear by my name. I think we're on the next slide if you want to go ahead to the next one. Don't swear by the name of God. Okay? That means don't make promises in God's name. God, the, another verse in the Bible says, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. You don't need to swear by the sun or the moon or God or anything like this. I don't, honestly, it, it drives me crazy when people say, you know, I swear on la da 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 on this person's life or that person's life. How, how cheap is someone's life that you would use them as a promise. You know, how, how, how cheaply we just throw those words around. Don't swear by God's name. Don't swear by anybody's name. Let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Or when we use the name of God to express surprise about something. That's something that's kind of common in our culture when we're, nowadays when we're uh, texting everything, OMG, OMG. Oh, that's the name of God you're throwing around. Okay? When you express surprise, oh my. No, this is God's name, the name that is above every name. And you're just throwing it around as, 
oh yeah, another surprise, or oh wow, amazing, or no, let's lift up the name of God higher. Let's respect God's name. Let's lift it up and say, this is a special name. We can run to the name of God, not just throw it around, you know, to text our buddies or say, wow, that's something cool. No, don't, let's not do that. Or when we use the name to curse someone else, don't ever do that. Don't use the name of God as a curse word. Because this is an awesome name, a valuable name, highly exalted. The name that is above every name. And so in our lives, it's the spirit of humility. The spirit of humility that says, God, I am just me, but you are amazing. You are the name. You have the name above all names. Your name is protection. Your name is salvation. Your name is healing. Your name is deliverance. Your name. Give God your own name for him. You know, I love, we, when we were in college, we used to listen to a band called Delirious. And I loved every time, for, for three or four albums, they, they, they had a new song every album where they had a song that talked about the name of God. One of them was the miracle maker. Jesus is, God is the miracle maker. I can't remember all the other ones, but there were some really, really cool songs. And they said, it's just like they're giving God a new name. And those were some of the most anointed songs on their albums. When we lift up the name of God, we put him in his rightful place. We honor him in humility. We say, God, this is who you are. It's, a, it's, a, it's an act of worship. It's lifting him up. Let's read. I have about four or five more verses that we have on the slides. This is the thing that God wants us to do with his name. Let's read some of these together. Uh, Psalm 61, verse 8. So will I ever sing praises to your name. Yeah, that's it. yeah let's read it all together. Sorry. One, two, three. So will I ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day. So one of the things we can do to the name is sing praises to the name of God. Let's go to the next slide. Psalms 44, 8. Let's read it together. One, two, three. In God we have boasted continually, and we will give thanks to your name forever. So praise the name of God. Give thanks to the name of God. Let's go to the next one. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. All right, next one. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. That has nothing about the name of God in there. Oh, the next verse. Sorry, it should have been verse 5 too. Verse 5, be thankful to him and bless his name. All right, so we forgot verse 5 on there. So I enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Uh, another one we don't have on there, Psalm 113, verse 3. From the rising of the sun to its going down, the Lord's name is to be praised. This is what we need to do with the name of God. Amen. Let's not take it, treat it as common. Let's not just throw the name of God around, but let's praise Thank the name of God. Worship the name of God. Lift him up. Put him at his rightful place. I want to read that verse in Philippians one more time. Because Jesus is our salvation. You know, in, in, uh, in the command, it says, God will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And, you know, I know that there's nobody perfect in the room here, okay? We've probably taken God's name in vain in our lives at some time. But you know, when we trust in Jesus and we believe in his name, there is salvation, there is deliverance, there is healing. And today, 
this afternoon, right at this moment in time, that salvation is here for all of us. Amen? That's the amazing thing. That salvation is available. That deliverance is available. That redemption, that cleansing is available right here, right now. Because Jesus took the guilt. Jesus took the punishment, the shame. It says in the Bible that cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. You know, the result of sin is a curse. The rightful curse should be upon our lives. The punishment should be on our lives. But Jesus took that curse and that punishment on himself. And because of that, he's been given a name. He's been given a name. He's been given a name. It is the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the name. This is the name. We all have names, but there's only one name. There's only one name at which we will bow. There's only one name which we will confess. It's the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's all stand in honor of our Savior. And let's, in his presence, before we're done here, let's take a couple of moments in his presence and just confess his name. Give thanks to his name. Praise his name. Honor his name. Bring glory to his name with your own voice and from your own heart. Because this is what God has taught for us to do. Maybe it's from an experience that you've had. Like we saw with Abraham when he went up on the mountain. He had an experience with God and got a new name. And gave God a new name. Maybe it's another something that happened. Praise God with your voice for the name that you have for him and lift up his name. Let's spend just a few minutes practicing this, doing this. Let's go ahead. Lift up your voices. Jesus. God, we thank you for your name. All through the Bible, we see your name, God. You are our shepherd. You are the way, the truth, and the life. You are our comforter. You are our healer. You are our deliverer. That's who our God is. 
that is our King. And today we honor you, O oh God. We honor your name. God, help us to live in humility. Help us to live understanding who we are, but more than that, who you are. God, we lift you high. We exalt you. We praise your name. We praise your name. God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that you are real and true and present with us. We commit this afternoon to you. We give you our lives. Help us to live this week in a spirit of humility before your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Have a great week. As always, we always have our leaders up front. If you guys need prayer for anything, please come and meet with us. We'd love to pray with you. If you need spirit, soul, body, come on up and pray with us. Amen. And we'll see you all next week. Have a great week.